Seems kind of stupid that we hide everything, especially as bad as my hand hurts. Okay. Um, so is that good? Is that a good size? Okay, so last time uh, we started to talk about discrete symmetries and we discussed parity at length. And um, had started to talk about uh, time reversal, uh, but ran out of notes due to do my um, in, you know inefficiency. <laughs> but uh, so what we're going to do is pick up where we left off, okay? And where we left off was that we you know we were looking for uh, some unitary linear, linear operator, much like what we used. Um, for parity transformation, uh, to basically, uh, you know, to to perform this time reversal. Uh, in other words, we wanted, you know, the operator to be able to flip the sign on the momenta for our annihilation and creation operators, but we also wanted it to, when it acted on our field, to reverse the time, right? And you know, what we had hoped for was a unitary. A linear operator, meaning that when you know when it operates on some linear combination of of fields or you know whatever, it would pass through any constants, any coefficients, right? And it turned out that that's impossible to do. Okay, you just can't do it, right? So one of the fixes, one of the ways out of it, is to require that uh, the T operator basically has almost um, it does have an effect on what we call C numbers, so just regular numbers, right? Complex numbers, right? So in other words, uh, if we want those two conditions, you know, if we want T to satisfy those two conditions, we have to have T that when it passes through a C number, uh, it takes the complex conjugate of that number, right? And the reason why we had seen was because we had these exponentials, right? When we did our time reversal, uh, as, you know, naively assuming that uh, you know this thing was a linear operator, we found that on one side we had positive frequency solutions, and on the other side we had negative frequency solutions, right? And the resolution to that is to you know uh, enforce this this kind of uh, property of complex conjugation when it goes through a number, right? So, uh, in other words, when you have t. Uh, when it passes through an exponential, and this isn't quite correct because it should have already acted on, say, some state, right? So it should be, well, no, no, no this is fine, right? So uh, even when T uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian, right, you're still going to flip the sign because you're passing through uh, uh, C numbers there, right? Uh, I and T, right? So this basically has the effect of reversing the time. All right, so it's like it's like I'm taking t to negative t. Okay, so this seems to have a, the right effect, right, um, and to what we uh, what we need. Okay, and so these things uh, these operators pop up from from time to time. If you go on and study supersymmetry, you'll see uh, you'll see cases of this. Um, but these things are called anti-linear or anti-unitary operators. Okay, and so uh, in the case of parity, we saw that you know uh, when you flip parity, uh, it would, or when you invo invoke parity um, or you know spatial inversion, it flips the vector, right? But it leaves the spin unchanged, right? But in this case, you guys have to think about you know time reversal. So so it would be like you know the movie is running forward like this, and and if you think of it as a physical spin, say it's spinning from your vantage point uh, clockwise. Right. 
But when you run the movie backwards, when you do the time reversal, not only does the vector change, the momentum vector change, but it starts it's spinning in the opposite direction, right? So what we have to do is try to construct uh, an operator, uh, this T operator, such that it um, does both of those things, right? So it, it flips the sign of um, the momentum, but it also flips uh, our spinners, okay? <coughs> All right, so you remember we had uh, for the we always took we wrote you know C S with a S sub or superscript S and S was either one or two and one or two we took to be spin up spin down right corresponding to spin up spin down uh, here we're going to take kind of a, a more general approach okay and it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a long road but for some reason this is the way that it's that's usually done okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider not um, a spinner that has its spin aligned, say, along the z-axis, but it's aligned along some general axis. Right? So in other words, what do do? In other words, if we have our coordinate system like this, so here's x, y, and z. Right. You, typically, we would imagine the spin being aligned along the z-axis, so we would have spin up pointing this way, spin down pointing this way, so we do a plus minus. Right. But in this case, what we're doing is we're we're considering some general vector, some general axis, right? And we're going to call this vector uh, it's a it's a univector, but we're going to call it n. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our spin aligned along this this uh, axis. So this thing has some angle with our original coordinate system. Right? So this angle would be phi, so this angle would be theta. Right? It has polar port, or polar angle. Okay? Spherical coordinates. And I don't know if, uh, if you guys, you guys in Brownsville, do you use Sakurai for, for quantum? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. So you might have run into this. Okay, so this is a problem. Uh, in Sakurai, can you guys see? Uh, where it's, I think it's chapter one, right? So in chapter one, you know, you're dealing with uh, spin one half states, uh, and you introduce it through um, the Stern Gerlach experiment, right? And so uh, one of the problems has, has you uh, to uh, solve the eigenvalue equation, bless, bless you, excuse me, uh, not for the spin al aligned along. Um, the z-axis, but along some axis that has an angle with respect to the coordinate system. Okay, and so that's why I'm going to write the solutions down. Okay, I'm not going to work through the problem, but it's it's doable. Okay, um, so the solutions are so spin up along that axis looks like this. Okay, and spin down looks like that, and they obviously have to be orthogonal. Okay, so uh, once you have spin up, you can basically construct spin down by hand, okay, or just by inspection. Okay, so you can write, uh, so, so now our uh, spinner, we're going to write it the same way with the spinner index S, okay, but uh, S1, S equals 1 and S equals 2 is now, it's not spin up, spin down on the z-axis, it's along this arbitrary axis, okay. And it took me forever, Peskin had it written like this, and it took me forever to under, try to figure out I, because it looked like he had written it as a as a you know as a vector or something, and I couldn't understand what he meant. So that's why I drew these arrows. So s equals one. We'll either have s equals one or s equals two. Okay, that's what that notation means. It should, uh, okay. it should be like uh, brace, like uh, brace. Name. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it confused the hell out of me. I, could, it, I, I stared at it for ten or fifteen minutes. Okay, um, but anyways, okay. All right, so we're going to have uh, our, our spinners uh, set up like this, okay? We're going to spin up and spin down on these guys, and we'll come back to these expressions in just a minute, okay? So what we're wanting from this time reversal operator is not only, you know, the, the flip in the momentum, but a flip in the spin, right? So um, here's where the notation gets even a little more confusing. Uh, so what we want is a spinner that has the spin flip. 
This one? Yeah. Okay. So what we want is a spinner that has its spin flip. Okay. And for some reason, uh, he uses minus S. Okay. It doesn't make sense because S is either one or two. Right. So if you flip it, it's if you have one and you flip it, it's two. Right. If it's two and you flip it, it's one. I don't know why he uses the minus sign, but he does. Okay. So I'm going to go with it. Okay. All right. Does it make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Because I mean, if you choose S equal to one, then you would have spin up, and then when it's flipped, it becomes minus one. No, but it's two. <laughs> this is equal to one two. or two. Anyways, anyways, it's not important. And it's just saying that, so we're going to try to construct uh, a spinner that's flipped, right, in general, from the original spinner, which is the, the CS on the, on the right-hand side. And what we are defining, and what I think I check here in a minute, is an expression for that. Okay, so we're going to use the um, the, the Pauli uh, two matrix, I guess you call it, right? And we're going to take the complex conjugate of that spinner because the spinner has some imaginary pieces. Okay. So I wanted to so here's yeah. So I checked it uh, for both cases actually. Let me come on. Okay, so here's the case where s equals one. So I. I put a question mark there because I want to make sure that, that it's right. Okay, so if I do if I do this 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 calculation right, I should get uh, c s equals two, right? Because I'm starting with c with s equals one. Okay, so on the right hand side I've got c s equals one and it's starred. Okay, so then I plug in my expression, right? So s equals one is the spin up spinner. So I use that expression from the previous page. And I take the complex conjugate of it, so the e to the i phi comes, becomes e to the minus i phi. And uh, what else? And then there's some uh, a factor of uh, i in sigma 2, so it kills off that, that first minus i. And I'm left with that matrix, okay? And then when I operate on that and multiply out the matrices, I, in fact, get the expression for what we call spin down along this arbitrary axis. Okay, and then I can do the same thing. I check the same thing for s equals two. All right, so I plug in the s equals two on the right hand side and take the complex conjugate. Right, I uh, pull out the minus i out of the poly matrix, do the multiplication again, and I get the expression uh, for the s equals one spinner up to a minus sign. Okay, so up to a minus sign, and that minus sign plays an important role. Okay. All right. So that means that you know we have our uh, we have our spinners, which we either have spin up or spin down. And when we flip those spins, they, they kind of interchange into each other, right? Up to this minus sign. Okay. So before, remember the first I had s equals one was the spin up, and s equals two was the spin down. Okay. All right. Like I said, mine. Yeah. Uh, what is sigma squared? Is it? Sigma y? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not squared. It's uh, it, sigma y. Yeah, it's sigma two. Why do we use sigma y when it's sigma x? Uh, it's just it's just different notation. I'm using one, two, three instead of x, y, z. I think he's asking why are we choosing no, sigma y, y sigma one as opposed to sigma one or sigma three? Oh. Sigma uh. Well, it was a. We, it was a guess, right? Uh, that's why I put the definition symbol uh, when I did. Let me find it. Um, where did that go? Oh, here. Right? So I'm defining this, right? This is what, this is uh, the way Peskin wrote it down. So that whole, this whole exercise was me checking to make sure uh, I understood so you know, what it's doing. It may not necessarily work for sigma x or z. Right. Yeah. In fact, it won't. That's why you chose sigma y. <laughs> Good guess. Okay. All right. Because you need, you know, sigma y is the one that has factors of i in it. Yeah. Right. So you need because you need something to uh, to cancel off. Uh, I guess that sigma i comes in by hand. Um, I don't know why he chose that. It's a mystery to me too. 
but that's why I went through to make sure that uh, when I when I do those operations, it in fact gives me the flip spend. Okay, uh, he doesn't give he doesn't give um, a reason why. He just says let's define the flip spend to be this. Okay. I don't know, but it works. Okay, so that's good enough for me. I don't know about you guys. But well, I, I mean, if I were doing it, I might assume I got it wrong because of that minus spin up. You know? Uh, yeah. Well, that's why, um, I mean, you just want to keep going. Right. Minus signs are going to pop up. Minus it. signs are going to pop up here because we're dealing with, um, with fermions, right? When can you prove it like two times, it's going to give you a little mm -hmm. minus sign. Mm -hmm. We also had a good point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like I said, it, it's not surprising that we get a minus sign in one of them. Okay. Okay. So, what we want to do next is to associate these spins with our spinners, our spin states. So, so the U spinner and the V spinner. Okay. And the way we're going to do this is okay, we're going to define our um, so I'm making a distinction between particle and antiparticle here. So the particle annihilation operator, uh, which we've written as AP super S, destroys an electron or, or, or uh, the particle with a spinner given by this, and this thing's going to contain the CS, so the CS that we had on the previous uh, paper. Okay. Whereas you're going to require the 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 B operator, the anti-fermion operator, to destroy a positron, so an antiparticle, and the spinner you're going to write in terms of uh, C flipped, right? Flipped with compared to uh, the, uh, the particle state. Okay, so we're just using uh, the definition of what we had before uh, when we solved this thing uh, a couple weeks ago. And so what we'll have is uh, we can compute. So so we'll have these um, annihilation operators, right? And what we can do is just like we did for CS, we can uh, flip those guys, right? So flip uh, the different spin pieces, right? And so what we'll find is that a flipped uh, A operator goes like this, A2 and minus A1, and a flipped B goes like B2 to minus B1, okay? So this is all, I mean, you might ask yourself, what are we doing? What are, what are we doing? This is all kind of preliminary stuff that you need, because remember, what we're after is we want to find uh, a time, oper you know, this time operator, time reversal operator that takes, uh, you know, P to minus P and, and T to minus T, okay? This is, and this is all preliminary stuff that you have to have in hand to do before you do that, okay? Okay, so we're getting there, all right? I, I say fine, we're finally ready to work out, but I don't think we are <laughs> yet, okay? And what we wanna do is try to uh, work out a relation between our U and our V, right? Because what time reversal is gonna do is basically turn a fermion into an anti-fermion, or, you know, uh, or run it backwards, right? Um, so uh, we're going to do this uh, trick again where we define this P tilde, or P twiddle, right, in which we flip the sign of the three vector part, so the three momentum, okay? And uh, I know I keep saying these things are going to show up in a homework, and they are, okay? I, I, I had to go back and find all the places where I said this is going to be a homework problem and write up a homework. I have a homework, but I, I, and I almost put it in the Dropbox, but then I was like, this is, uh, it's either, the problems are either too easy, because the last time I taught QFT, people weren't so bright, and, uh, and either that or uh, this, the problems I had worked out in, in my notes. Okay, so, so what I want to do is go back and, and I'll write, uh, write up some short problems that you can do, okay? Anyways, so this vector P tilde satisfies this relation, right? So we've got sigma two coming in uh, because we're doing these spin flips, right? 
And you can show, it's not too hard, I think it's just a couple liner uh, proof, but you can show that uh, this thing basically commutes, but it puts a, it takes a complex conjugate of your sigma matrix, okay? All right. Like I said, you'll prove it in the homework. I'm just going to assume that that's the case. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start for some spin s at some moment of p, right? And for that spin and that p, we have some u spinner, okay? And what we're going to say is, okay, you, so um, uh, the flip of that, right, the time reversal of that is going to have a flipped spin, right, and it's going to have the three momentum reverse and sign, right, not the, not the full four vector, okay, it's just going to have the three momentum, okay. Um, and so this thing, U minus S P with P tilde as the argument is going to be the spinner with the reverse spin of momentum. Okay. All right. So let's let's do let's build it. Okay. So what I would have is uh, u minus s p tilde. Right. So the first two first two pieces uh, in this uh, in this spinner are just the standard uh, way we build the u spinner. Right. The square root. We just replace p with p tilde. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. then I would have uh, c minus s, right? But I'm replacing c minus s with the expression that we wrote down earlier, right? That definition. Okay, so that's where that's where that comes from. I'm putting uh, those two things together. Okay, and now what I want to do is I want to take uh, this minus i obviously goes through the sigma two when it passes through um, uh, these uh, these square roots. We use that relationship that I had at the bottom of that last page, right? And so it'll, it'll pass through, but it changes the sigmas into sigma stars, right? Okay. And then what I can do is I can rewrite this thing, right? So I notice that uh, what I have here, I can write in a matrix form. I can pull out those sigma twos, right? And they're just, it's just a sigma two times an identity matrix, right? Uh, and factor minus i, and then what's left is our original spinner. You know, the, the, the normal spinner starred, okay? And so that tells me uh, that the flipped, or, or so the spinner with, uh, you know, time reversed with the flip spin, the flipped momentum, uh, can be written like this, okay? So this sigma two, matrix you can write in terms of the Dirac gamma matrices, in particular gamma 1 and gamma 3. Okay? So if you take gamma 1 and gamma 3 and multiply them out, you should get that sigma 2 matrix. Okay? Okay? Okay, and I can do the same thing for uh, our anti-fermion spinner. I define some flip, uh, some time reverse spinner, right? And I find that I get the same thing, uh, even up to the sign, right? This is now it's V uh, star, okay? But the thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, the V, remember, it already contains a minus, it already contains a minus S, right? So if I take the uh, S here to minus, then it's like minus, minus S. Okay. And minus minus s gives me minus an overall minus sign uh, in front of the c to s, right? Where s is either equal to one or two. Okay. Well, let you absorb that for that. Right, because that's that. Um, yeah. All right. Okay, so we now have time reverse spinners U and V. Okay, and what we want to do is what? Um, 
we want to uh, use our notation for these guys, right, for the, the uh, annihilation and creation operators, the flip spins, and we're going to define the time reversal transformation of these guys. Okay, so what I want, this is what we want, right? So I want, when I do a similarity transformation of these annihilation operators, either for uh, the spinner or, I mean, either for the fermion or the anti-fermion, I want the, the, the uh, these indices to pick up minus signs, right? I, in other words, I want to flip the spin and I want to reverse the momentum, okay? So remember, the subscripts on these are the three momentum, okay? Even though I don't draw uh, a vector on top of them all the time, right? And in general, we saw when we, when we did the parity transformations, we saw that there was a, a, a phase there, right? Do you remember the eta uh, when we did this? And it turns out that in, this, in these transformations, there's also a phase. But it doesn't come into play, it doesn't affect the physics, so we're just going to neglect it, okay? So this is what we want, all right? So now uh, we can actually go and try to compute the time reversal of our field, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by taking uh, as the similarity transformation of the field, right? Uh, and on the on our right hand side, I just plugged in my, the usual expression for the field. Okay, this is the expression uh, in terms of the positive and negative frequency solutions. Okay, and now I take my t's and I let them operate inward. Right. So, uh, uh, and and when I do, I'm taking into account. So if you go from the first line to the second line, you'll see some, th some different things happening. So uh, when the T on the far right comes in, remember it has that effect on C numbers that it, it flips basically um, uh, uh, the time component or, uh, or it changes C numbers in, into C star, right? It takes a complex conjugate. So these exponentials flip signs, right? And then what you see is that I'm using the relationships uh, that we had before, um, or that I have at the top of this page, right? So I have a, a T and a T uh, hitting this kind of combination A. Oh, wait, you guys can, you guys can, I just realized they can see my point on here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, so what I have is the T and the T, they come in here, right? And so let me just sketch it. So I would have T, say, operating on this first term of AP, and then U, S, P, T, right? But I can insert one, so I can insert a, I can insert two T's here, right? Remember, they're unitary, so I can just write this both T. And then these things, right? These things are the things that we've been working so hard to compute, right? This is we already defined what this was, right? And this is the guy that we worked hard to find um, back here, okay? Right. So that's what that's how I get to this second line, okay? So I'm doing the I'm passing the T through gives me flips the signs on the exponentials. I insert two T's in between these two guys, and then I do the similarity transformations uh, using. Uh, you know, these expressions that we've derived before, okay? And now I want to do our normal, or it's not normal, but do that change of variable trick that we've been doing, right? Where I take P to P twiddle, where P twiddle is just, has the three momentum uh, reversed, okay? So, yeah. Uh, P twiddle they got my two keys, uh, like like an eight operator. Yep. Well, if we saw that, it's it's maybe not always. No, it's unitary. It's not always linear. It's not it's not linear. No, I mean the fact that we've seen that if we apply to the U's, it may cause a minus sign. Uh, yeah. So, but, but I haven't done anything. All I've done is insert, you know, inside of here you can think of there's an identity operator. 
And then I'm just rewriting that identity operator as T2. Because of the unitary. Right? That's all. Okay. Did, did we prove the unitarity? Of no, we're just assuming that that's the case. Yeah. That's because that's how we, we have, remember, going back to quantum mechanics, anytime we right. do any type of transformation, it's got to be unitary because of the it's not, then we screw up. I, th I think we were thinking on our same way of thinking that since it, if one T acts on something and it got a minus sign, that um, perhaps uh, it may not be unitary. Because only one component got a, got a minus sign as opposed to both components. Um, when it acted on um, C down or C up, it turned into minus C down. Um, I guess if it adds a minus sign, you're just doing it again, you take a minus sign away. Well, you would, yeah, so you would have an overall minus sign, right? Yeah. But, um, like, I mean, it's equation. T, T equal one, mm -hmm. is that T is equal to inverse of T. That's, that's not the identity condition. If T dagger is equal to T inverse, that's, that is called unitary. Mm -hmm. right? But here T is equal to inverse. It's not the identity oh, I'm taking T, so I'm writing. T is equal to T inverse. So if the operator is unitary, then T T dagger right. is one. Right? Yeah. But T T is equal to one means that T is equal to T inverse. Right. Um yeah. T minus one. You can see T is equal to T minus one, not T is equal to mm -hmm. um. Yeah, it might just be, yeah. There might just be a difference in notation from Pesky. Like maybe he's just assuming we can just write it as T T Um, I mean, whatever the notation is, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that this thing is unitary, so I can do this. From quantum, T is anti-unitary. Show that T is kind of different than the unitary operator. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, that's what it said. So we even call it anti unitary. Right? So that's, yeah. Yeah, it's anti unitary. So, so that means that the unitary condition is this, right? It's not TT minus 1. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. It works. Okay, so in any case, I'm just inserting one. All right. Inserting one is fine, but we're having a problem with the definition of one. <laughs> well, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I know what one is. Um, okay, so where was I? All right. So we're doing, okay, so we've gotten to this point, all right? And what we want to do is do this change of variable. Because what it's going to do is allow us to use uh, those relations that I'll never be able to find now. What page is that? Six. Five. You guys got me all discombobulated. <laughs> uh, yeah, here. All right. So if we take uh, P to P twiddle. Mm -hmm. right, then we'll be able to use these relationships that we derive for the flipped or the time reverse uh, spinners. Okay. Right? And so that, that's what I've done here. So I've taken uh, these things right, and replaced them with their uh, time reverse counterparts. Right? And you see the gamma 1, gamma 3 out in front. Okay? And another thing that you can do, another mind-blowing trick 
is that you can take this dot product. Remember, we had to reverse the sign on our spatial component uh, to preserve this dot product. You can actually pull you pull the minus sign out, right? And it, then it looks like uh, the, the T has flipped sign, okay? And so what happens when you do that is you pull out a minus sign, right? And then that minus sign goes here, right? So now you have the fermion spinner associated with the positive frequency solution and the, uh, uh, the anti-fermion spinner associated with the negative frequency solution. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of tricks in here to get it to the right form, okay? But you get what you want, right? You get what you hope to get. Right, by using all of these tricks and things that we had derived. All right, so you get, when you do the similarity transformation for the time reversal of our field, you get the field with the time reversed. Right? You go back and you look at the expressions up to this constant matrix. Okay? And that's, that's, all we, that's all we need. We just need the field to reverse its, its, the sign of its time component. Okay? Is that the uh, next to the uh, negative T? Is that the ah? Uh, oh, that's just a piece of that. <laughs> Sorry, I, I could. I wanted to make absolutely sure so that we don't write anything down. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. So what we want to do is, you know, we want to check. So now we don't have the field transforms. The next thing is to check the pieces of the Lagrangian, right? So the bilinear. So the scalar and the vector bilinears. But, but first, you have to know how psi bar transforms. Right? Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. Okay, so I'm taking uh, similar the, the you know time reversal of psi bar, okay, and I'm rewriting psi bar in terms of psi dagger and gamma zero, right? and uh, I pull out the dagger, okay, because t dagger is equal to t, which I think we've established, hopefully, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. I'll take that as a resounding yes. <laughs> okay. And then I'm going to use, so for, for this guy, this is the guy that we just computed, right? So I can plug in what we got up here, right? So I get this and we get this, right? So I'm just taking this thing and plugging in what we got and then taking the Hermitian conjugate, okay? So I get. This thing times the Hermitian conjugate of gamma one, gamma three times gamma zero. Right? Remember, gamma zero star or gamma zero conjugate is just gamma zero. Okay. And so then, what I need to do is I want to get back to psi bar. Right. So what I have to do is take this gamma zero and pass it through these things. Okay. Um, and and as I do that, remember they they anti commute. Right, the anti-commute. So you're picking up minus signs, and then at the end, uh, I think you have to, uh, because this, this Hermitian conjugate is going to flip uh, gamma 1, gamma 3 into gamma 3, gamma 1. Right? And then there's some minus signs because those, those matrices um, uh, pick up a minus sign under Hermitian conjugation. Okay? I'll, work out, I'll work out one in more detail, okay? just to show you how it works. Oh, yeah, here it is right here. <laughs> I thought I did it, okay? All right, so here's what I did, okay? So I've got this, the minus gamma one, gamma three dagger times gamma zero, okay? And now I take the Hermitian conjugate, okay? Minus sign stays the same, but it flips the order of gamma one and gamma three, okay? And like I said, the, the, you can check, um, these guys are um, both, uh, uh, they flip sign under Hermitian conjugation, okay? Uh, so that gives me an overall minus sign, and I've got gamma 3, gamma 1, gamma 0. Right? But what I needed was to get this gamma 0 over to the uh, psi dagger, right? Because I want to get psi bar back, right? So I have to pass this thing through, so i got to commute it through, okay? And I'm using the anti-commutation relation, right? That says that um, gamma mu, gamma nu, is equal to two G right now. All right, so I'm using this, okay? So I pass gamma zero through gamma one, 
I get the two, uh, the, met, the one zero component of the metric tensor, and then minus gamma zero, gamma one, right? That guy is zero, it's off the diagonal element, right? So I pick up a minus sign, then it's that sign, right? And then I have to commute this guy through the gamma three, and again, I get an off diagonal element of the metric tensor, and then I get gamma, minus gamma zero, gamma three, all right? And then finally, what I want to do is put that, uh, put it back in the same order that I started with, which was gamma one, gamma three. So I do another, um, I pass this gamma three through the gamma one, and I pick up another minus sign. Okay, and then finally I use psi dagger gamma zero is equal to psi bar. Okay, so that's how I went from that step to that step. Okay, so now we know how the field transforms, right? And we know how psi bar transforms, okay? So we can check these bilinears. Right, so let me start um, with the scalar case, okay? So this would be like the mass term in Lagrange, okay? All right, so we want this thing to be invariant under time reversal. Okay, so I'm gonna hit, hit it from both sides with the, with the T operator, okay? And I insert one uh, in terms of a TT, -T, right? TT dagger, whatever. Um, and then I plug in what we have. What we have for this guy, we know how this thing transforms. We know how this thing transforms, right? And when I put it together, I get psi bar, uh, some string of gamma matrices. So I have gamma one, gamma three, gamma one, gamma three, right? Uh, but I know that, say, gamma i squared is just uh, minus one, I think. I think it's minus one. But it doesn't matter. In this case, it doesn't matter because I've got two factors of it, okay? But I think it's minus one. Um, so what I want to do is move this gamma one over so I can hit it with the other gamma one and just give me either plus or minus one, whatever it is, I can't remember. Um, and so I do that. And because I have two factors, it doesn't matter if I'm, if I'm putting minus one or one, okay? But the point is, that once I do that, I get the bilinear back, it's only been time reversed, okay? So what about uh, the vector piece? Well, the vector piece, like we saw last time with parity, is a little trickier, okay? So what I wanna do is take um, the time reversal of psi bar gamma mu psi, okay? And what I do is in, insert uh, one, uh, in between the gamma mu and the psi, okay? And so that's gonna give me what? It's gonna give me uh, the transformation of this thing, right? the transformation of this thing, okay? So this is gonna give me, um, remember there's a dagger in here, right? So it's gonna, it's gonna give me a gamma mu star, okay? And then I use what I, the transformation rule for the psi bar. So I get psi bar, gamma one, gamma three, gamma mu star, and then over here for the psi, uh, for the particle field, I get minus gamma one, gamma three. Okay, so what we have to do is get to consider separately the zero and the i components, okay? So let me do the, the gamma zero term first. Okay, so I'll do this. And gamma mu star. Oh, because it's, okay, so it's like what we saw earlier, so, um, so I have uh, T psi bar gamma mu T, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm writing this as uh, T psi dagger gamma zero gamma mu T, right? And then I pull out the Hermitian uh, conjugate, right? So I have T psi gamma zero star gamma mu star Right. And the gamma mu doesn't have doesn't have time dependence, right? So it can come out in fine. Right. Okay. All right. That's it. Yeah. Sorry, I should have been more explicit. Okay. So let's do the time or the, the mu equals zero piece. Okay. So I have uh, I just plug in mu. Uh, I plug in zero for mu. Right. And we know that gamma zero is just the 
off diagonal ones, right? So it's uh, star is just gamma zero. Right? And from there, it's just a matter of moving stuff around, right? So I, I um, let's see what I want to do here. Okay, because I want to get uh, the gamma zero is this piece, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out the transformation of the vector. So I need to get this gamma zero either to the far left or to the far right. Okay, so I chose to go to the far right because I'm conservative. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, I go to the far right, okay, so I'm passing gamma zero through. Uh, I'm picking up minus signs along the way. And finally, they cancel out. And, I'm, and again, I'm putting them in order where gamma ones are next to each other and gamma threes are next to each other because I know what those matrices are squared. Okay. So I end up with, for the mu equals zero piece, I get the plus sign. Okay? Okay, for the mu equals i case, uh, it's a little trickier because um, you have to take into account uh, the fact where i can either be one or three. Okay, so there are some terms where uh, you have to take into account the, you know, the, the metric component, right? So that's what I did here, okay? So I have gamma i star, okay? And gamma i star is minus gamma i, so that kills that plus sign, okay? And now what I wanna do is, uh, again, I wanna get the gamma i to the far right, okay? So I pass it through this gamma one, and so that's gonna give me a two g i one, and then the flip-flop minus the flip-flop of those two gamma matrices. Okay, so this thing is, is zero unless i equals one. All right, so I have two, so I get two terms out of this. I get the case where i is equal to one, in which case uh, I can rewrite this gamma one as gamma i. All right, it's like, uh, because, you know, so everybody understand what I'm doing here, so, so, so I'm right. I have GI1 up, right, but I can write that as, it's the same thing as GI1 down, right? Anyways, so so this thing contracted on that is gonna be zero unless I, I have gamma i here, okay? And then I have gamma three getting this gamma three, That's this whole term, okay? And then from the other term, I still have gamma one, gamma three, gamma one, gamma i, gamma three. Okay, so I'm still trying to get this gamma i to the far right, okay? So I use the gamma three squared, it is just one, right? So I get two gamma i here, okay? and then I pass this guy through, and, um, uh, no, I didn't do that, yeah, what did I do? Oh, I'm passing, yeah, I'm going this way. So I'm passing this, I'm gonna to try to group the gamma ones together to get rid of them. Move gamma one over, right? So that gives me gamma one, gamma one. I know they anti-commute, so I uh, can pick up a sign that changes this to a plus sign. Okay. And then I pass uh, gamma i through this gamma three, and so I get this thing. Right? And again, I have to account for the fact, or for the case where i, z, I can be three, and in that case, it's going to give me uh, a minus sign because gamma three squared is minus one. That's what it is, okay? So gamma three gives me a minus sign. And so what happens is these ter two terms, which came from uh, the metric component terms, uh, you can actually cancel out. And all that's left is the, this minus uh, gamma i, okay? So for the vector piece, it goes like minus. Okay, so if I put everything together, I can write the transformation of the vector bilinear like this. Uh, so the, the, the mu equals zero piece doesn't change, right? But the mu equals i pieces do change, right? They flip sign under time reversal. And this is exactly, again, what we want for vectors, right? We saw the same thing for parity, right? For parity, the z mu equals zero piece was unchanged, but just like a, just like a normal vector, um, the, the vector parts change the sign, okay? And that's what we would want for a time reversal. Okay, so those are um, those are how, so that, that's time reversal in a nutshell, okay? 
And um, uh, if you want to see how the other bilinears, so like how the pseudo, how the uh, pseudo scalar, the pseudo vector transform, you can uh, look in Pesca and he works them out. But it's just a matter of doing the same thing, but you have a gamma five that you have to deal with. Deal with. Okay. Okay. So this brings us to our last discrete symmetry. Okay, and this is charge conjugation. So this is a symmetry that. Uh, takes particle to antiparticle, and antiparticle to particle. Okay, um, and it's not going to do anything to the spin of the momentum. Okay, so it's going to take. If you have a fermion with the spin s and the momentum p, it's going to. When you operate with uh, charge conjugation, this is going to flip it into an anti-fermion with spin s and p. Okay, so that's how we define it. All right, so again. We can write down what this thing does to our annihilation operators and or our creation operators, right? So what I'm doing here, I'm defining my um, uh, our operator, and in this case, we, we have no problems with it being linear, okay? So it's like parity, in a sense, right? and, uh, more, than, more than time reversal. Okay? So I can, I can easily write down a transformation that takes my uh, Fermion annihilation or creation operator into the anti fermion uh, operator. Okay? And again, there's some phases, possible phases here, but we're going to ignore them because they don't really, they don't affect the physics. Okay? All right, so what we're after is we want to again check the effect of charge conjugation on our field. And to answer that, because charge conjugation takes fermion to anti-fermion, we have to work out a relationship between these two spinners, the anti-fermion spinner and the fermion spinner. Okay. And the way we do that is we start with an earlier expression, which was this guy. Okay, so it would be this Vs star. Okay. And so I'm going to take our the Vs that we worked that we wrote down and plug it into this. Okay. And then I'm going to take the star, okay? Um, oh, I took, yeah. So I took, let me make sure I understand what I did. Um, yeah. So I'm taking, so here I have C the minus S. And I'm using this definition that we've written down earlier. Okay? And then I take the star, right? So here I have still to take the star, but I take the star of this thing. And then what I can do is I can pull out this off diagonal matrix. Right? And what it does, because the reason I'm doing this is because I want to I want a relationship between V and U. Right? So I need to get something back out that looks like U. Right? And so the way you can accomplish that is having an off diagonal matrix, which basically flips the up and down or the, the top and bottom components. Okay. And so what we see, so this matrix right here is just uh, i times gamma two or minus i times gamma two. Okay. So you can easily write down or you know figure out that uh, the relationship between u and v looks like this. Right, uh, u is proportional to v star, right, and v is proportional to u star. Okay. Right. So with that, we got with that, and our, you know, knowing how these annihilation operators or creation operators transform, so we can go straight to uh, computing how the field transforms under charge conjugation. Okay, and it's it's pretty simple compared to. Um, the time reversal in the case, okay? Uh, so you just hit it from both sides with C, right, again. Uh, and what happens is uh, you pick up the transformation of the spinner, you pick up the transformation of, of the uh, annihilation operator, okay? The signs on these exponentials stay the same. Okay? And now what you see is that you can just pull out uh, a minus I gamma two and what you're left with is our field, our original expression for the field, that star, right? Because I had these stars on the spinners. Okay? But then we can use a trick that complex conjugation 
uh, well, we're using the trick that Hermitian conjugation is uh, complex conjugation transpose. Right? So I'm rewriting uh, complex conjugation as a Hermitian conjugation and then a transpose. Right? Because the transpose of the transpose is going to get you back to the original. Okay. Um, uh, right. So, so what I'm doing is uh, I can pull this gamma 2 into this transpose. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, what else? Am I doing? Okay. Then I'm uh, inserting uh, here, I'm inserting gamma 0 squared. Okay. So the gamma 0, one of the gamma zeros goes with uh, psi dagger and it gives me psi bar. And I'm left with one gamma zero. Okay. So this is how the field transforms into the charge conjugation. So this thing. Okay. And you can go through the same exercise with psi bar. Okay. And what you find is that it transforms um, like this. Okay. <laughs> so it psi bar transforms into Psi, basically, transpose. That's okay. Okay, so we can uh, work out how the bilinears transform. Now, knowing the, how the fields transform, we can work through the bilinears. So I'm going to do the scalar bilinear, okay? And then I'm going to, I'm going to, the vector one is going to be for homework. Okay, I'm gonna, I am going to put it on homework. Okay, so let's do it. All right, so this is this will teach you some tricks that uh, will come in handy later on. Okay, all right. So I want to take the the charge conjugation of our scalar bilinear. Okay? I'm going to do the normal thing, insert one in between side bar and side, okay, in the form of c times c, and then I have the you know the two pieces that we just computed. Okay, and so I have this. All right, so this is. Remember, these are, this is a matrix equation, right? And, and in fact, it's a matrix equation, a matrix multiplication that gives us a number, right? Because I'm taking side bar side, okay? So when you're doing these things, a lot of, sometimes it's, it's helpful to keep track of uh, the indices of these things, okay? So what I have is, this. Okay, so here I have, um, so the minus i is giving me an overall minus i. Okay, so I have gamma 0, gamma 2, psi, psi bar, gamma 0, gamma 2. Okay, and what I do is I write in explicitly some indices. Okay, so this is a matrix, right, a, a 4 by 4 matrix, so it has two indices. This is a matrix that has two indices. This is a column or row vector. Right, so it only has one index. This guy has one index, and then these guys both have indices, right? And because I want it to be a number, uh, all these guys have to contract out. Okay, so you see that at the end, I write E and then A. And A is the, the first um, index that I put in here, okay? Because what I'm trying to do is, you know, I'm going to write down something that says, uh, you know, that when I do this, Charge conjugation, you know, I get something back that's psi bar psi, maybe with some stuff in front. Okay, that's what I'm aiming for. Okay, so what I have to do is move this psi bar through this psi, right? But when you do that, you have to keep you have to keep in mind that um, these guys are fermions, right? And they obey uh, anti commutation rules. Okay. So when I move, so now that I've written, so that's, that's the nice thing about when you write the indices, when you write out the indices, you can move stuff around, okay? You just have to make sure at the end of the day that everything contracts back out, okay? So that's, what, that's, the, that's the usefulness of writing the indices, okay? So I go from here, I'm passing psi bar. It'll, when it goes through this psi, I pick up a minus sign, right? And then I move psi all the way to the end, okay? Uh, but I have to make sure that the indices are contracting, right? So I have to, when I move, say, this psi over here, this gamma 2 comes along for the ride, right? So, as well as this gamma 0. 
Um, and then once I make sure that I have all the indices in order, right, and, and contract in order, uh, here, this is a little different because you see now that because I have a psi over here that this index, this index contracts with this guy. But they all, they all contract out, so it's fine. So at that point, I can just go back to my indexless uh, form, right? And I have this, okay? And I can see already that I've got two factors of gamma zero and two factors of gamma two. So I obviously want to put those together, right? So that I can um, drag them away. And so I use the fact that gamma zero and gamma two anti-commute to move it through. I pick up a minus sign, right? Gamma zero squared gives me a one. And gamma two squared gives me a minus sign. So I pick up, so in the end I get plus. Okay, so I see that under charge conjugation, the bilinear psi bar psi is equal to psi bar psi. Right? And so it's invariant under charge conjugation. Okay? Okay. So that, that, that's what I have. Uh, for today, and what we're going to do next time is start on um, uh, uh, working out. Um, shit, what is it? I don't remember. I, yeah, well, yeah, we're getting towards fine numerals. Okay, uh, well, we're going to quantize the theory using. Uh, yeah. Path yeah. No, we're not going to use path integrals. Or, uh, the canonical, yeah. So we'll work, next time we'll start to work out how to compute uh, scattering amplitudes. That was the word that we were looking for. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting that. Okay. So we'll do it for, for these guys' sake. We'll we'll go through the scalar case again, but we're going we're doing it differently than we did in the summer. Right. So we'll work through the um, canonical uh, canonical uh, quantization. Uh, for the scalar, and then we'll apply what we learned for the fermion case. Okay, and I'll put together a homework um, maybe tomorrow or tonight. Okay, and I'll let you know when I put it in the Dropbox. All right. Okay. Two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, I'll make it do. I don't know. It depends on how many problems I put on there. It, it's you know, whenever you get it done, it's fine. This is a small class, so I don't, I'm not going to really hold you to um, strict deadlines, you know. Um, so, yeah. Okay? All right. You guys in Brownsville okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I'll see you Monday. Mm -hmm. All right, have a good weekend. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.